I am. Yes, I know. We'll need a coach, I fear. I, I thought of it too, uh, on my way here. But I didn't get a coach, because I thought you might not yet be ready. Yes, well, certainly. I, I think of a lot of things. There's no one can prevent that, can they? Hmm? No. Well, everybody's thoughts are theirs, and theirs alone. That's very clear. Yes, well, they wouldn't be if someone I could mention had his way. But, um, still. Oh, Mr. Knox, forgive me, but did we not catch sight of you the day my brother left for Yorkshire? Me? Oh, no. Well, I'm sorry, but I certainly would have said so. Then you'd have said wrong. Oh, well, of course, you know best. First time I've been out for three weeks. I've had the gout. If ever you want a shelter in London, they know where I live, at the sign of the crown, Silver Street, Golden Square. You can come at night. Once no one was ashamed. Never mind that, it's all over. Forgive errors, I've forgotten all my old ways. My spelling may have gone with them. Yours obediently, Newman Noggs. P.S. If you go near Barnard Castle, uh, there is good ale at the King's Head. Say you know me, and I'm sure they will not charge you for it. You may say Mr. Noggs there, for I was a gentleman then. I was indeed. I have been wronged. My feelings have been hurt, wounded, insulted, and by men who are your friends. What friends? I have no friends. Well, by the men I met here then, and have been persecuting me. And if they are not your friends, and you know what they are, more shame on you for bringing me among them. And there's something of your brother in you, I can see. I hope there is. I should be proud to know it. I will not bear these insults any longer. Insults? What do you mean? What do I mean? You ask me that, Uncle? Remember what took place in this house? Yes, cry, cry. You're right to cry. No, but not to give way. Back in there, that was even righter. You're right not to let him see you cry. I shall see you soon, and so will somebody else. Yes, yes. I must go. Bless you. Thank you. I will speak and ask. Who made me a fellow such as this? If I would sell myself a drink, why wasn't I a thief? A swindler, a robber of pence from the trays of blind men's dogs rather than your drudge and pack horse. If my every word was indeed a lie, why wasn't I a pet and favorite of yours? A liar. When did I ever fawn and cringe to you? I served you faithfully because I was a poor man. You talk just now of tampering. Who tampered with the Yorkshire schoolmaster? who tampered with a jealous father, urging him to sell his daughter to old Arthur Gride, and tampered with Gride, too, in a little office with a closet in the room. You mind me now. And what first set this drudge to listening at doors and watching close and following his master's cruel treatment of his flesh and blood, his vile designs upon a young girl that made the miserable and drunken hack stay on in service in the hope of doing her some good, when otherwise he might have easily relieved his feelings by pummeling his master soundly and going to the devil. I'm here now because these gentlemen thought it best, and when I sought them out, as I did, there's no tampering with me. I told them that I wanted their help to find you out, to track you down, to finish what I'd begun, to help the right, and that when I'd done it, I'd burst into your room and I'd face you man to man, and I'd, I'm like a man. And now I've done it, I've had my say. Let anyone else have theirs, I've done at last. So far away. And the first act of Nicholas, when he became a rich and prosperous merchant, was to buy his father's old farm. And soon he and his wife were blessed with a group of lovely children. And within a stone's throw there was another such retreat, enlivened by children's voices too. And here lived Kate, with many new cares and occupations. But still the same true loving creature and gentle sister as she'd been in her girlish day. And Mrs. Nickleby lived sometimes with her daughter and sometimes with her son. And spent much time relating her experience. Especially on the matter of the management and bringing up of children. With much solemnity and importance. And there was one grey-haired, quiet, harmless gentleman who lived in a little cottage hard by Nicholas's house and in his absence attended to the supervision of affairs. His chief delight and pleasure was the children. With whom he became a child himself 
and master of the revels. The little people could do nothing without old Newman Knox. Oh, 